morning, LSA, and welcome to church. Most of you have already picked up your Christmas shoe boxes, but there are still plenty left in the lobby. We want to let you know that they're due back Sunday, November 13th. So make sure you get them filled and back to us by the 13th. Then the following Sunday, November 20th, we are having a baptism and membership service. This is your last chance to connect with Deb if you're wanting to become a member or be baptized. Deb will be around after the service, so make sure you connect with her today. LSA is partnering with the VON to offer exercise classes for those 55 and up to help improve balance, strength, coordination, flexibility, and to prevent falls. These are free classes for the community and our congregation. They will start November 7th and are 45 minutes to about an hour long. There are three class times to choose from. Registration packages with all the details are available at the Info Central Desk and at the office. We are calling out for volunteers. We are in need of the right people to help out with our kids' midweek and junior youth programs, as well as our Tuesday morning maintenance and janitorial team. If you have any questions or just want more information, go to our website, lsa.church. Oh, you're 
Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. All right, amen, amen, yeah, make some noise, yeah. Well, good morning, um, and we're just so glad you are here at Lakeshore St. Andrews, either in person or online, um, and we have a full house today, which is so good to see, yeah. So why don't you turn around and, and, and welcome some people, show them the love.
He is worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Yeah, let's pray. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
We thank you that we can trust in you alone. Because we know we can't trust in anything else for everything, for sure. People fall. People are broken. We can't trust in other people. We can't trust in the world around us. But we can trust you and your word. And you promise to give us a future and a hope. You want to bless us, God. You want us to have unity. You want us to love others. You want us to shine a light in a dark place and build your kingdom. And you promise to always be with us and never leave us, never ditch us, never turn your back. And so, God, we want to lean on those promises even right now. God, I pray that you will bless um, our offering, whatever we give to you, whatever we have. We know you will multiply it for your purposes, not ours. And we pray for A.B., that you will speak mightily through him and that we would have ears to hear. We thank you, God, for this gathering. And uh, I just pray a blessing on each person here that they will feel your touch um, here and as they go on their way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Deb. I'm on staff here at LSA. And we have something new this morning in your midst, and it is this new monthly bulletin. So if you didn't get one, we will have them on the way out for you as well. And I just wanted to highlight, highlight the fact that we're going to be producing this once a month. So take it home with you if you have one, and you can refer to all the good information that's in there for you. So just you can expect one a month. So last week I was standing up here talking about the stars and I told you that that moment that I didn't know really that much about the stars. But if it is true that when the stars align that some good things begin to happen, well I am here to tell you today that I believe the stars have aligned because I have the amazing privilege of introducing you to our guest speaker this morning. And he is a friend and a colleague. When I remember A.B. working here, he exuded kindness, support, many traits that he would spread himself to all of us, whether it was walking slowly through the foyer, but I remember mostly his humility. And in his leadership, it was marked by the same thing. But you could also add to that this amazing lens that he always had on what the culture was doing. And you can add to that the many pet names that he would have for all of us that just, my name was Debsta, and I'm sure it's Debster to you today. You can add to that the uncanny ways that he would shorten every sentence down. For instance, Tuesday Kappa, we would say, would you like to meet me on Tuesday and go for a cup of coffee, eh? I love that. This man has joy and love for the word of God. And honestly, this is what we remember most about A.B. So our friend, A.B., has agreed that after the service, he would hang out with us for a while. Uh, we're going to set up in the meeting place just so that you would be able to have a chance to reconnect. And we know that there's so many of you, we'll have to give them a little water breaks in between. But uh, we are thrilled and certainly honored and grateful to God that he has brought you here today. So now, will you, LSA, join me in welcoming AB back to the LSA platform this morning. We missed you. 
I'm just going to pray over you, A.B. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much. You are just such a good, good God. You have uh, directed A.B. to us this, for such a time as this, this morning. And, Lord, only you could be sovereign over this holy moment. We are so grateful for all those that have gathered here to celebrate him and to celebrate uh, all the, uh, the friendship and, the, and all that we've enjoyed together in the past here in this place. Lord, I ask that you would bless him. Bless him in his health. Bless his family. Bless Charlie and Lawson and little Lacey. Lord, we pray that the seeds that you have sown in them will continue to be watered. And Lord, we pray that uh, we know that this day won't be for long, so we ask that you would bless him and keep him in your keeping power with safety on the way back. And now, Lord, we do pray and ask your blessing over him as he brings your word, your gospel message. And Lord, would you get all the praise, honor, and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. It really is such a privilege to be here. I was 40 when I left and 50 when I came back. <laughs> and I know you're saying, Ava, you don't look any different. Well, maybe a few kilos heavier and a bit of hair less. But certainly when I walked in this morning in the front doors at quarter past eight, it felt like home. And I thank you so much for your love that you've given me. And uh, I've, been, I've been to... Washington and New York and cottage country and Montreal and Quebec, but this I've been looking forward to out of all those places. So thank you for having me. And for those who don't know me, thank you for your grace allowing me to be here. And Brian, thank you so much for your grace for allowing me to be here to share a few thoughts this morning. In 10 years, a lot happens, doesn't it? A lot of seasons you go through. Six months, it feels like you're flying at you know, 200 feet. It goes past pretty quick. But once you get 10 years, it's like you're at 30,000 feet and you've got a bit of perspective of the seasons that you've gone through over those last 10 years. You know, for me, it involves a separation and divorce. It involves kids living 1,000 kilometres away. Things that are tough, seasons that you never thought would happen. Seasons you thought, not on my watch. Not while I'm walking close to God, this stuff's not going to happen. And suddenly these seasons just come and bite you in the butt. And you wonder, how? How do I make it through? How in the midst of this do I grab hold of that elusive peace that the Bible talks about? Come to me, who all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, sometimes that just feels like it's sand through the fingers, doesn't it? Or the peace that transcends all understanding. How do, how do you get that in the midst of the season that you wished you never had? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And some of you are in that season right now. Some of you have been through the season. Some of you seem like you're just on season over season over season. I remember a guy in the Bible, Moses, who was in one of those seasons. Let me talk to you a few moments about Moses. Because I think he's got some ideas for us on how to navigate those seasons that you feel like will never end. Picture this. You're standing alongside Moses on the edge of the Red Sea. You've basically just stolen a million slaves from Egypt. Their economy is about to grind to a halt, collapse, and they're not happy. So they've decided to come after you with all the might of their army. They're not playing games. They're coming in hard and they're coming in quick. And you're trapped. You're at the edge of the Red Sea. You can't go forward. You can't go back because the army's coming. You can't go left and you can't go right because there's deserts and mountains. You are trapped. 
So how in the midst of that do you find peace? You don't know the way out. You don't know what to do. It seems like it's impossible. Seems like it'll never end. Is it true that you can have peace in the midst of that? Is it true when death seems likely you can have peace in the midst of that? Is it true when everything that you thought to be true seems to be wrong, you can have peace in the midst of that? What do you do when you're hemmed in by those kind of circumstances, by sea and an army pursuing? I want to suggest three things. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and wait for it. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and wait for it. Let's go back to the Moses story, Exodus 14. At the edge of the Red Sea. Armies on their tail. Hemmed in, hemmed in, can't go anywhere. If the Israelites lay down their arms and they surrender in this moment, the Egyptian army may very well take them back. I mean, they could do with their million slaves back, right? Kick the economy back into gear. Moses, though, no hope. No hope. Moses and his generals and his leaders, no hope. But every day, Joe, Jim, and Mary, they've got a good chance of surviving. They could go back to Egypt, resume where they left off. The Egyptians would probably make it harder for them. They'd ramp up the tasks back at home, but at least they're alive. At least they're standing up and breathing, right? Well, that's an option. Can't help Moses, but they could help themselves. But we know clearly from the story up until this point that that's not God's heart for them. In fact, God's been telling them all the way along, I've got a promise for you. I've got a special land I've picked out just for you. And we're going there, flowing with milk and honey. There's peace there. I've promised it to you. It's coming. So, yeah, going back was an option, but it wasn't God's option. And here's the challenge for Israel in that moment, which is the same challenge that you and I face when we're hemmed in by the Red Sea, the armies, and the hills in the desert. Fear. We fear that which we can't control. Control is all about trying to get peace. Control is all about putting the pieces of the puzzle back into place so that we can find peace. And we like to control because that's where we think peace is found. We only fear that which we can't control. You wouldn't I live by the beach on the Sunshine Coast in Australia? So for us, the surf is an everyday thing. If someone invited me out into a boat, we're gonna go four kilometers off the beach in our boat, and they invite me to stand on the edge of the boat and jump off, I would be fearful. There is no way I would jump off a boat out in the middle of the ocean, four kilometers off, into the water. It just wouldn't happen. Now, it's not necessarily a fear that's a reasonable fear, but Fear doesn't have to be based on reason. It's just that which I can't control. I can't control that which is in the water. So I'm not jumping off the boat. Now, I didn't know this about our brains until just the other month. But in our brains, when it comes to fear, there's this right neuro pathway that responds to fear or danger. Perceived danger goes into our emotional brain. We feel it. Fear. Fear. Then it's supposed to go into our thinking brain, and then out of our thinking brain, it goes to a response. Danger, emotion, thinking, response. That's the way it's supposed to go. But often when it comes to fear, it skips the thinking. Danger, emotion, response. 
So as I'm standing there on the edge of the boat, I'm just going danger, emotion, response. I'm not thinking at all about the perceived danger. That's often why we see teenagers, for example, teenagers who are uh, break and entering, or teenagers who you look at them the wrong way and they want to, they want to hit you. All they're doing is perceived danger, emotion, response. I was on the subway in New York just last week and there was a gentleman who came on the train and he was getting up in everyone's face who just looked at him. And there was this older gentleman with a cane who was standing at the door and this gentleman just happened to look at him and this man came to him and grabbed his cane and was pushing him up against the wall. And so a gentleman and I just came up nice and close and he then just raised his fist and he wanted to come and ride. That is a person who's doing a perceived danger, emotion, response. They're not thinking through it at all. Reflect on a season that you've been re in recently over the last few years that's been out of your control. Out of your control. You weren't in control when your savings for retirement took a dip. You weren't in control when you couldn't go to the hospital through COVID to see a loved one. You weren't in control when your kids went off the rails. You weren't in control when your health spiraled. Weren't in control when that person said that they didn't love you anymore. Now, if you remain in your emotional brain in that kind of situation or that kind of season, it could lead to fear, right? Could lead to fear that the loved one's never going to come home. Could lead to fear that your retirement plans will never come to fruition could lead to fear that your kids may never make it to heaven. could lead to fear that you could be alone for the rest of your life. Perceived danger, emotional brain, response, fear. But it's interesting that Moses, speaking by faith the word of God, wants to, the people of Israel to engage their thinking brain. He doesn't want them to stay in the emotional brain. He wants them to engage their thinking brain. And so what he does, he comes alongside them, he stands in front of them, he says, do not be afraid, stand firm. Now out of fear, we want to take hold of the reins. In those circumstances and those seasons, we get busy manipulating, trying, scheming, controlling when we feel that we're forced against the wall, we're gonna do something, we're gonna make it happen. I'm the only one that's gonna make it happen, so I better get doing. But instead, Moses says, don't be afraid, stand firm. And what he's really saying is engage your thinking brain to remind yourself what you know to be true about God. Don't respond out of fear, don't respond out of emotion, Respond out of what you know to, be about, know to be true about the one who can control what you can't. What do you know to be true about the one who can control what you can't? Does he love Israel? Absolutely. Tick. Has he proven himself to Israel in the past? Absolutely, tick. Is God able to do the impossible? Tick. Has he got the power to do something in that situation? Tick. Even if he doesn't do something in that situation, does he still love them? Tick. Is their identity in who he says they are? Tick. Is he all over it? Tick. I love that second phrase. Then stand firm. Dig your heels in. Lean into the wind. 
Because everything is going to come against you to behave out of fear. Everything is going to come against you to behave out of your emotional brain. Be impatient. Do something that fixes it, that bypasses the God factor. But instead, Moses says, I know it doesn't look good. Like, I've got no idea how to get us out of this. But what I do know is A, B, C, D, E about God. And so he's telling me, stand firm in that. As the wind comes and everything wants to push you over and put you on the ground and let you give up, stand firm. Here's the moment. When you stand firm in surrender, that's when you get your peace. We think we, if we stand firm in control, that's when we get peace. But it's actually counterintuitive. It's the other way around. It's upside down kingdom. We get peace when we choose to stand firm in surrender, not in control. In this moment, I will not take control. I'll stand firm. In this moment, I will not fear and take control. I will stand firm in, in surrender. I will not let chaos of my predicament drive me to take control. I will stand firm in surrender. Do not be anxious about anything, says Philippians chapter 4. And then it says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. When? When we surrender those circumstances that we can't control and we're not anxious, that's when the peace comes. Sometimes we pray for peace like it's this magic wand that just falls on us like a sheet. But I don't think scripture teaches that. I think peace comes when we engage the thinking brain, remind ourselves who God is, and in that moment stand firm, regardless of what's coming against, regardless of what our circumstances say about who he is and what he's doing. Stand firm about what we know and who he is. A challenge, though, for the people of Israel with Moses is now they come to the conundrum. Okay, we stand firm, but how long? How long do I have to stand firm for? How long is this going to go for? Is it a day? Do we stand firm for a week? Do we stand firm when the Egyptians get to point A, point B, or point C? When? Hello? What's your name? I'm Andrew. Mm. What's your name? I, you can have that, because I forgot to turn it on anyway. He's good. How long do you stand firm for? When can you make a move? When can you take control, say, God's not turning up. He's obviously not on his way. He's missed the train. Is now the time to take control? Is now the time to make it happen? I've been there. Oh, I've been there. On a four-year journey of challenge, I've been there in the moments where all I want to do is take those reins. Boy, am I going to make this happen. Because God, you seem quiet, quiet and silent, inactive. It actually feels like you don't care very much. It feels like you've forgotten. It feels like your plans certainly aren't matching up to mine. So I'd best take hold of those reins. Moses says this to them in verse 14 of chapter 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. (laughs) 
When you're standing firm in the midst of a gale, a chaotic season, it is so tough to be still. We so desperately want to find that place of peace. Peace often revolving around our circumstances being rearranged into a place that suits our outcomes. That's when we find peace. But we're not talking about that kind of peace. We're talking about the kind of peace that comes when the enemy's coming and the ocean's there and you can't go left or right. That's the kind of peace we're after because whether we like it or not, we're all going through seasons that we don't like. And we can just grit our teeth and make it through and hope for the best or we can have peace in the midst of it. And the way Moses encouraged his people in the midst of it was to stand firm in who you know God to be, be still because God's fighting for you. You don't know what's happening in the background. Unless you've got a data download from God about everything he's doing over this season, it's guesswork sometimes. But is he doing something? Is that what we know to be true? Does God work for the good of those who love him in every circumstance? Is it true? Then can we stand still? Can we stand firm and wait? With our head to the wind? With bits of shrapnel flying in the gale and hitting us? It's so much easier, isn't it, to stand firm when you've got a person this side and a person that side? And then another person there, and another person there. And you're all holding firm. It's so much easier to find peace in the gale, in the storm, when you're all silent, waiting for God to do what only God can do. Believing that he's got it, right? The tech team, in a moment, are going to play you an audio clip. They're going to turn the lights down. I'm going to encourage you to close your eyes. It's an audio clip of a hurricane. And I want you to imagine that you're in the middle of the hurricane. Feel it. Hear it. Hear the shaking. Hear the, the gust. And just imagine, and my apologies if you have been in a hurricane. We don't get them much where I live. Uh, so it might come across insensitive. So if you've been in one, I apologize if it raises anything for you. But if you're okay with it, sit in the middle of the hurricane and just feel it. Imagine it's just life. All right? Close your eyes. Lights will come down. Tech team will play. pretty intense, can't it? 
And that, that's what life can feel like. It can feel like you're in the middle of that house that's just shaking and you don't know if the walls are going to stand up and you don't know if your doors are going to blow off. It just feels like it's going to come crumbling around you. That's what you can feel like. It's interesting that Hebrew phrase for silence or be still is not a word. Hold your tongue. Stop your tongue from moving. It's also used to describe an engraving or a scratching on metal. Once it's there, it doesn't move. Once it's in position, that's it. And the idea that Moses is conveying is if God is fighting for you in the background, even though you can't see it, all he's asked you to do is be still. He doesn't need you to fight. He doesn't need you to take control. He doesn't need you to manipulate, to do things that are outside his character and will behind. He doesn't need you to do that. He said he will fight. He said he will make good things happen for all those who left. He will make it happen. All you need to do is... Oh, but it's so hard when you visit the hospital. It's so hard when you see the shares coming down and your Bitcoin going out the window. So hard when they haven't rung for weeks. So hard when the job interview didn't go well. So hard when the grocery prices and the fuel prices are just going up. It's so hard. But all he asks you to do is be still and he will fight for you. I'm going to ask the tech team to play that again. This time, as they play it, the lights come down and you close your eyes. I want you to imagine maybe a season or a circumstance or a situation that you find yourself now. And I want you to do a little bit of thinking brain. Not emotional brain, thinking brain. God, I know that you are fighting for me even though I don't know even though I can't see it. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, doesn't look like I feel it, but I know you are. I know it to be true. What if I just stand firm and wait? At some point, the hurricane's got to go. At some point, the battle's got to be won. How it turns out, you and I, we may not know. But at some point, God's going to be victorious. We need only dig a house in and wait. So this time, as you listen, self-talk a little bit about the season you're in right now. God, I know you're on your way. I'll be silent and wait. Thanks, tech team.
It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my afraid, stand your ground and you will see what the Lord will do to save you today. We so desperately want miracles but miracles are found in that liminal place of surrender. They're not found in control. God doesn't need you when we control. We don't need God when we control. We need ourselves. But you want to see the ocean part? You want to see your enemy drown? It's in the waiting. It's in the silence. It's in not being afraid. God's got it. God's got it. So I want to invite anyone today who is in the midst of needing to stand firm needing to loosen control and surrender and stand firm, I just want to invite you to stand because I'd love to pray for you. An Australian prayer is no better than a Canadian prayer. But we are in a battle. And there are faith-filled people who are failing to stand firm because of fear. But the church is unstoppable. The church is unstoppable when its people join her arms and stand firm in courage, knowing that they will see what the Lord will do today. We only need to stand still. So if you'd like me to pray for you, would you stand and just as a sign of surrender, just hold your hands out and then I will feel privileged to pray for you today. We've all got something, don't we? <laughs> We're certainly not alive. It's amazing, isn't it? We look at other people around and think, they have got it all together, I'm sure. But all of us in some way are saying, God, I wish I could control this, but I can't. So we, as your people, humbly hold out our hands, Father. And we confess there are times throughout each day and each hour where we say, what the? How? 
when, what. But we declare as your people that you are big enough, that you are able, that you don't need us, but oh, we need you. So as the disciples pray, we ask for more faith. We ask for forgiveness for those moments where we doubt that you can part the sea, that you'll come through, that you've got it and that you'll be victorious. You know each individual heart. You know exactly what's happening, what their thought processes are, what their season is. And I pray that if not today, then tomorrow or the next week, would you meet with them personally? Would you speak into their very spirit? And as they open up the word and reflect on who you are, would you speak to them and remind them that you have got it? You need only be still. We profess again this morning our trust in you. Lay this at your feet. Go get them, God. We can't wait for your miracle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What a supremely powerful message for us today about battle and about how to do it well. I'm so thankful for that message from A.B. and I'm sure that you guys would like to talk more with him. He'll be in the meeting place right after the service. Now our benediction. From Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.